<clears throat> I don't know if it's the Daniel fast paying off or what, but boy, I sure felt the Spirit during that singing today. It really blessed my heart. When we focus on Him, that's what it's all about. Well, I'd like to read for you today uh, from the book of James, chapter 2. Book of James, chapter 2. The book of James, uh, to me, in my opinion, is one of the most practical books in the Bible. It's one of those books that uh, really impacts our day-to-day -day living. It's kind of nuts and bolts, and it'll help you when you go out tomorrow to work or whatever you do. Uh, James asked this question, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Well, the implication, that's a rhetorical question there, but the implication is no. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does, not, does, does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe there's one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. The scripture was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Now, I might need to explain a little bit there. Um, we are justified before God by grace through faith, not of works. It's a gift lest anyone should boast. But we are justified before men by what they can see. We're justified before men by our behavior, by our actions. Let your light so shine before men that they may see. That's what the Bible says. Verse 25, In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds or works, is dead. Today I'm going to talk about faith, real faith. Now, we hear about fake stuff today. We hear about artificial things today. In our Daniel fast, we were to swear off all artificial things, all sweeteners and preservatives and dyes and all those kinds of things. We didn't want anything um, artificial. We don't want to hear fake news, do we? We want to hear real news. When you, when you put the word real in front of something, it gives it credibility. Real coffee, real leather, real news. Some of you remember when Coke was considered the real thing. When we talk about real, we're talking about the genuine article. I want to talk about real faith. There are a lot of people who say they are Christians, but their actions say something else. There's an inconsistency between what they say and what they do. There's an inconsistency between the talk and the walk, and this is a problem. And James addresses that situation in this passage. He agrees with Jesus when uh, he said, by their fruit you will know them. You see, we all know that actions speak louder than words. We know that. If you say one thing and you do another, guess what people are going to believe? They're going to believe what you do over what you say. This is one of the most controversial and misunderstood passages in the book of James. Some have misunderstood it to say that you're saved by faith plus works. And I would agree that a casual reading, if you lifted it out of context and did not interpret it in light of all Scripture, uh, you might read it that way. You're saved by faith plus works. But we know that's not true because... Paul teaches that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's how we're saved. And James comes along and it sounds like he's saying that we're saved by grace plus works. Who's right? 
Paul or James? Which one of them is right? Well, of course, if you believe in the inspiration of Scripture, you believe they're both right. It wouldn't be in there if it wasn't true. We believe that the Holy Spirit uh, overshadowed the writing of Scripture, so there are no contradictions. Paul and James did not contradict each other, although some down through the ages have felt that they did. The, the issue is that they're addressing different issues. Paul was addressing legalism. That thought that I have to keep all the Jewish laws and regulations in order to be a Christian. I have to jump all the hoops. I have to cross all the T's and dot all the I's. And if I'm just really good, if I amass enough good works and and points with God, then maybe he'll let me in. Paul was addressing legalism. James was not addressing legalism. He was addressing laxness or looseness or laziness. Uh, those that said it didn't matter what you did or do as long as you believed. Maybe you've heard that argument. Well, you can't be saved by works, so you can't uh, be condemned by works. So it's all of God and it's none of man, so it really doesn't matter how you live. It's You've probably heard that before. And that's what, that's what James is addressing. He's addressing that particular philosophy. Two different issues. But they both use the word works, so that's kind of why it's a little confusing. When Paul uses the word works, he's talking about keeping the Jewish law. When James uses it, he's talking about a Christian lifestyle. He's talking about acts of love, acts of righteousness, the things that men can see. Uh, Paul focuses on the root of our salvation, and James is focusing on the fruit of our salvation. Paul is talking about how to know you're a Christian, and James is talking about how to show you're a Christian. Paul's talking how to, about how to become a believer, and James is talking about how to behave like a believer. And we don't want to minimize either. They're not contradictory. Ephesians 2, starting with verse 8, says, and this is the part we're familiar with. We hear this part a lot. <clears throat> By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We often hear that part, but we seldom hear the second part. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So here you have it. We're saved by grace, through faith, unto good works. If you get them out of order, that's when you get in trouble. If you put the cart before the horse, then your theology's messed up. If you have to work in order to be saved, you've got it backwards. You work, you behave yourself, you do righteous acts and good deeds because you are saved, and that's the fruit of your righteousness. It's the evidence that you have been saved. You're a new creature in Christ. You're different. You're not the same person you used to be. And there is evidence of it, evidence that people can see. That's what James is saying. If I, go, if I have spots on me and I, go to, I suspect that I have measles and uh, I go to the doctor for a diagnosis, it's not the spots that cause the measles. It was the measles that caused, caused the spots. It's not the works that cause the faith, it's the faith that produces the works. So as long as you keep it in the right order, then you're going to be okay. So let's get a little more specific here. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to say that real faith is not just talk. Talk's cheap. Talk is cheap because the supply is way more than the demand, if you've noticed. Verse 14 says, what good is it if you claim to have faith, but you have no deeds? What good is it? A person claims to have faith, talks about it, knows all the right phrases, been there, done that, got the bumper sticker, got the t-shirt, got the uh, cross necklace, got the WWJD bracelet, the whole nine yards, but there's no evidence in their everyday life. No fruit. No changed behavior. George Gallup says that 50 million Americans say, I'm born again but you don't see the evidence in their lifestyle. So real faith is more than just talk. It's a change. Jesus said, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom. Not everybody that has the bumper sticker, the t-shirt, the notebook, the Bible study, 
whatever. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter. Not everyone who is a professor of Christianity is actually a possessor. James is saying that real faith is more than just talk. Number two, real faith is more than a feeling. I was tempted to break out in song there, but uh, in my falsetto voice. But I'm going to suppress it. That wouldn't be pretty. Real faith is more than a feeling. It's more than emotion. A lot of people confuse emotions and sentimentality with real faith. Well, you can get that from Little House on the Prairie. You can get that from the Hallmark Channel. You can get warm fuzzies and cool tinglies. You can cry a few tears, but that doesn't mean it's real faith. That's sentimentality. Nothing wrong with it, but it's not real faith. You can be emotionally moved and not be changed. In fact, we used to sing a song, I'm tired of being stirred and not changed. I'm tired of reading something in God's Word and then not going out and doing something about it. I'm tired of getting blessed in church and then walking out the doors and not being any different. It's more than emotion. It's more than feeling. Verse 15 says, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. One of you says, Go, I wish you well. Keep warm and well fed. What good does that do? I see sometimes, uh, I see a post on Facebook or Twitter or something, and, and uh, someone says, I'm not feeling well, or I've got this or that issue, and someone says, Sending thoughts your way. I'm going, <laughs> sending thoughts your way, big deal. Not even prayers, just thoughts. If you're going to send something, send prayers at least. In a Peanuts cartoon, Charlie Brown and Linus are inside all warm and cozy. Snoopy's out in the cold, shivering in front of an empty dog food bowl. Charlie and Linus... They're talking about how sad it is that Snoopy's hungry and cold. We really ought to do something, you know. So they went out and said, be of good cheer, Snoopy. That's it? Be of good cheer? I need some food. I need some warmth here. Throw me a blanket or something. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about faith is a whole lot more than good intentions. If you're taking our new small group over here, it's intentional living. It's putting feet to your prayers. It's putting action to your intentions. Someone said that Charles Schultz actually got the idea for that cartoon from this very verse. What good is it if you see someone in need and say, I feel for you? Yeah, I've been there. I know what you're going through. I feel your pain. James is saying real faith is more than just words. It's more than just feelings. If you left church today and, and slammed your finger in the car door and, and you're there screaming in excruciating pain and I walked by and I said, I really feel your pain. How, how much good would that do? Would that help a lot? It'd probably add anger to the pain. Do something for goodness sake. Open this car door. Real faith is more than just sympathy and emotion. Real faith results in action. Real faith compul compels us to do something. You know, when Jesus looked at the multitudes, it didn't say he felt compassion. It said he was moved with compassion. It motivated him to get up and do something. Real faith gets involved. When you become a part of God's family, you have some family responsibilities. A real believer cares about other people. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. When one mourns, we all mourn. We feel the pain of one another. That's what it means to be a part of one body. I've noticed one thing for sure, that if I accidentally hit the wrong nail with a hammer, my whole body comes to the relief here. I might do this. Or I might hop around, or I might do something, but my whole body feels the pain. It's not just that that poor little thumb is isolated out there all alone. Well, that's the way it is in the body of Christ. 
1 John 3, 17, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. That's how we know we belong to the truth. Real faith is generous. It's not just talking the talk, but it's walking the walk. Not just feeling for people, but actually doing something about their situation. 1 John 3.14 says they'll know we're Christians by our love. That's how people know. They can see it in action. Verse 17 says, faith that is not accompanied by action is a dead faith. If it doesn't produce works, it's a dead faith. Real faith is more than something you say, it's more than something you feel, and it's more than something you think. For some people, faith is intellectual, a matter to be studied, discussed, and debated. It's all theoretical. When I was in Mid-America, I took philosophy class. And the teacher's uh, rule was that you have to spend X number of hours outside of class for every hour that you spend in class. Well, it just didn't take that long to read the chapter and do the homework. What are we going to do now? He said, well, why don't you start a philosophy club? You can just sit around and philosophize. And, uh, you know, discuss the, the lesson, discuss the questions, just discuss the implications and just philosophize. I say, sounds good to me. <laughs> we'll do that. So we sat around and we talked, we debated, we discussed. Did we change the world? No. <laughs> Never left our little table there in the cafeteria. A whole lot of theory. No action. Verse 18 says, someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds, you're into faith, I'm into works. You've got your thing, I've got mine, it's all cool. But don't ask me to make any commitments. I just want to talk. Don't ask me to make any sacrifices. I don't like sacrifices. Don't ask me to change my lifestyle. I like me the way I am. And then they, he goes on to say, I'll show you my faith by what I do. I'll show you my faith. Faith is invisible, so how, how can anybody see it? Anybody can claim to have it. How do you know? Well, you know by the effects. The effects are visible. James would have made a good Missourian. <laughs> he would have said, what is our motto, by the way, our state motto? Show me. James says, show me. You say you have faith? Show me. He would have fit right in in Missouri. Because the effects of faith, faith's not visible, but the effects of it are. If you claim to be a Christian, there should be evidence. If you're brought on trial, let's see, John used to sing that song, I think. Uh, well, I can't remember the name of it, but yeah, yeah, if you were brought on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would there be enough evidence at home? Work, school, down at the Dollar General, the local cafe? Would there be enough evidence to convict you of Christianity? Somebody said faith is like calories. You can't see it, but you can see the results. Ooh, ooh, that hurts. If I tell you my personal health is a high priority, you might ask, well, do you eat right? I'd say no. You exercise? No. Get plenty of rest? No. Take vitamins? No. Ever go in for a checkup? No. You'd probably conclude that I was lying. My health is not a priority. And how would you conclude that? By the evidence. By the behavior. By the way I act. By the things I prioritize. That tells the world what's important to me, because actions speak louder than words. We used to sing a chorus that said, if you're saved and you know it, your life will surely show it. That's what James is saying. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, different, changed. 
If I was standing in the foyer and you came in a little bit late for church and I say, good to have you today, better late than never. Now, oh, well, I've got an explanation. I was standing on the corner in Winslow, Arizona, and, <laughs> and uh, I just stepped off the curb in this big semi going about 70 miles an hour, just plastered me on the uh, radiator of the and they had to peel me off and and kind of slowed me down. Took me. I don't think so. When you have a genuine encounter with a semi trailer going seventy miles an hour, it makes an impression. You're different. You're changed. You're not the same as you were before. So sorry, I'm not buying that one. Well, you see the implication there? We talked about how big God is. We talked about Isaiah's vision uh, in Sunday school class today. But Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. He got an encounter. He, he had a vision. He an increased, renewed revelation of who God really is. And when you have a genuine encounter with Almighty God, you're different. You're changed. You're not the person you used to be. So, the question remains, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Real faith produces change, always. It's not just something you say, it's not something you feel, and it's just something you feel. It's not just something you think. And number four, it's not just something you believe. It's not just head knowledge. It's not just something that you have accepted mentally. Verse 19 says you believe there's one God. Good. Bergen translation says big deal. Even the demons believe that and shudder. The demons believe in God. It takes more than that. There are a lot of people who have strong beliefs about God in the Bible. They can recite creeds, catechisms, doctrines, Bible verses. James says, big deal. Just saying I believe in God is not enough to get you to heaven. Even the devil can do that. It's more than just head knowledge. The word believe, I know the Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. But the word believe in the biblical sense means to trust in, to cling to, to rely on, to commit yourself to. If you believe in Christ, you have cast yourself completely and totally on Him and trusted Him for salvation. That's what we mean when we say believe. It's not just something you say, think, feel, or believe. What is real faith? It's something you do. It results in action. Verses 22 through 25, James contrasts two very, very different people. Ahab, let me... Hey, I combined them there. Abraham and Rahab. Abraham's a man, Rahab's a woman. Abraham's Jewish, Rahab's a Gentile. Abraham's a patriarch, Rahab's a prostitute. Abraham's somebody, Rahab is nobody. Abraham's a major character, Rahab's a minor character. They had only one thing in common, their faith in God. Verses 20 through 22, Abraham believed, you've heard, you know the story, God told him to deliver up his only son, the, chi the child of promise. How can this work? We prayed and we believed and, all, and finally we got this son and you're now asking me to sacrifice this son. Didn't make any sense. But he believed. He took God at his word and he obeyed. He took his son, he cut the wood, he built the altar. And re he was ready to sacrifice his own son. But he never lost his faith. If you remember the story, when he, his son asked him a question, he said, we will return. We will return. That's faith. I'm going to sacrifice my son on the altar. And somehow, some way, I don't know how God's going to do this, but I've got faith that he's got this. We're both coming back. That's faith. He knew God would provide somehow, even if it meant raising him from the dead. His works proved his faith. And then Rahab, you know the story of hiding the spies 
They were coming into Jericho. She hid them and then let them down the outside of the wall. If you, le- if you read the lineage of Jesus Christ, Rahab's in there. She's in the line. A nobody. A woman of ill repute is in the lineage of Jesus. She risked her life to save the spies. Our faith's not determined by what we do, but it is definitely demonstrated by what we do. Went to Niagara Falls this summer. I love Niagara Falls. Beautiful place. And when I go, I I remember the story, and you've probably all heard it, about the tightrope walker that pushed the wheelbarrow across Niagara Falls. He asked a fella if he believed that he could do it again. Of course, his answer was yes. He'd seen it with his own mind. That eyes, that's a head knowledge. Yeah, I believe you can do it again. I, saw, I just saw you do it. I'm sure you probably can. That's head knowledge. The kind of faith I'm talking about is actually getting in the wheelbarrow. That's the kind of faith I'm talking about. Putting your money where your mouth is, so to speak. Yeah, I believe in God, and it's going to dictate every decision, every choice, every behavior, everything I do. I'm in lock, stock, and barrel. No holding back. 100%. I'm going through. I have decided, made up my mind, to follow Jesus. No turning back. And that's the kind of faith I'm talking about. That's real faith. Get in the wheelbarrow. In a very real sense, that's what God says to us. Our faith is demonstrated by our actions. Our behavior shows what we really believe. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Would you stand? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I realize that on a snowy morning, this is the cream of the crop. These are the diligent ones. These are the ones who braved the elements to be here today. But it could be that in this crowd, there might be someone that God spoke to today. And I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Can you point to changes in your life? Is your life different than it used to be? Do you have different priorities? Are you more mature this January than you were last January? Is God making a transformation in your life and in your heart? It doesn't matter what you say you believe. Is there evidence? That's the question. Is there anyone that feels the need to pray today?